Well, good morning, everyone. Today is Sunday, May the 22nd. Welcome to Unity Center of Light. We are a spiritual community that nurtures those who are, and I'm paraphrasing here like a big dog, um, uh, nurturing and growing their uh, spirit, mind, and body. Pam could have said that by uh, heart, but I'm giving her the day off, right? So welcome everybody. My name is April May and I'm going to be leading us through our process today. We have lots of exciting things going on, but what I'd like to do is start out by sharing um, with us together our mission and foundation statement. So um, someone give me a thumbs up that you can see that. Great. So please join me. And since you're on mute, you can say this with as much uh, zeal as you want. The mission of Unity Center of Light is to empower individuals to express their indwelling divine potential. We teach there is a power within each of us far greater than anything that exists outside of us. And our foundation statement, there is only one power and one presence active in my life and affairs, God the good, omnipotent. So it is. So like I said, we have an exciting day today. We have lots going on. And we're going to start out with a first different thing this morning. And that is that we are going to have not the daily word reading today, but the absolute word reading. And uh, we'll talk more about that. But Kathleen's going to share that with us. Forgive. With love and kindness, I forgive myself and others. Forgiveness can be a heavy bag of rocks on my shoulders when I drop the bag and begin to set the rocks aside one by one. I embark on a journey toward wholeness. My divinity is always present and available along with my humanity. It is my infinite resource of support and strength on my journey. When forgiveness feels difficult, I remember forgiveness is a process of removing the errors of my mortal mind while remembering the truth that each person is fully divine. I focus my awareness on innate love, dominion, and strength. I love, honor, and accept myself so I can forgive others as well as myself. Each act of forgiveness increases my freedom to live a happy and fulfilling life. With love and kindness, I forgive myself and others. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay, so it is my great good pleasure this morning to introduce somebody that I've known for longer than I have fingers to count it up. I don't even remember how many years it's been now. Um, but the Reverend Dr. Paul Hasselbeck is, uh, we call him a rock star in metaphysics. Um, and he has lots to share with us today on the practical applications of metaphysics in our lives the way we find ourselves right now. I believe that I also met Paul in 1996. He was speaking to Butch about that earlier um, at, when I was over at Unity by the Bay. I think they came and visited there. So mm -hmm. what I'd like to, to do is say that over the years I've experienced him in a lot of different ways as a teacher in metaphysics classes, also at Eastern Region conferences, but I've also had the good pleasure of um, helping put together a program with him that we'll talk about a little bit more later today. But what I'd like to do now um, is um, turn this over to Paul and say, welcome, welcome, my friend. There was so much more I could have said about you, but it would have taken up all your time. So I say, take it away, my friend. Have a wonderful time. Thank you. When someone does that, I go, did I really do that? <laughs> it's been a wonderful time with Unity. So I'm going to get a PowerPoint slide going here. And like you, I'm going to check and make sure. Are you seeing the first slide? And then I want to go from the beginning. 
Okay, are you seeing that slide? Fantastic, so I'm ready to rock and roll. Uh, yes, I'm the metaphysics guy, and I always think that we're romping. We're having a metaphysical romp. And first of all, I want to thank Reverend Butch and April for inviting me. It's an exciting thing to be with you today. And so what I really would like you to do is sit back and relax like our little minion friend there. And if you want to get a hold of me, my email address is alberthasselbeck at gmail.com. Actually, you can also take out your phone maybe and take pictures of my slides if there's something valuable you want, like maybe this one. My website is paulhasselbeck.com where I publish my weekly blog called The Absolute Word. It also has my calendar of, of where I'm appearing, when, what, classes, and all that kind of stuff. And then I've had a podcast that I've been doing since 2007. It's called metaphysicalromp2.com. And I do that with my friends, the Reverend Doctors Bill and Cher Holden. So that's how you can get a hold of me. Don't hesitate and reach out to me because I like interacting with people. And so this is practical metaphysics for daily li living. And I, in some ways, I'm just going to scratch the surface. In other ways, towards the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you some very useful things that can help us use uh, the metaphysics in a way that's very practical. And so I like to start with this quote from the Gospel of Thomas, the, the second saying, Jesus said, let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he'll become troubled. And when he becomes troubled, he will become astonished and he will rule over all. So what do we get troubled about? Well, some of the things that I share might be different than you currently believe or have heard before. And a, a minister's job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And I kind of lean to afflicting the comfortable because unanswered questions are far less dangerous than unquestioned answers. So the spiritual journey is really about seeking answers to our fundamental questions like who are we what's god what about creation and all that however the answers we have need to be constantly questioned so we can grow and expand in new and wonderful ways so i always start here pretty much every lesson with a quote from myrtle fillmore it's her definition of god god is it neither male nor female but principle. And Charles' primary definition of God, according to Paul, is by the, by the term mind, we mean God, the universal principle, which includes all principles. So we're not talking about a super, supernatural being that looks like us, that lives in a place called heaven. We're talking about something very fundamental and something very user-friendly. And so when we talk about principle, what do we mean? Well, if you look at Merriam-Webster, a principle is an underlying faculty and a fundamental law. So when Myrtle and Charles says God is principle, they're referring to underlying faculties and fundamental laws. And these are faculties. In fact, you've probably learned about the 12 powers from Reverend Butch. The 12 powers are 12 faculties. Now, that's not all of them. There's a bunch of them. In fact, I've written a book called Use the Truth You Know, Unity's Principles and Premises, where I've gone through all the published writings and found every principle I could find. And when we talk about a fundamental law, we're talking about spiritual law. You probably have heard of the law of mind action, for example. Spiritual laws are laws of mind. And when I say it that way, I mean little m mind. These are laws that when we learn them, we can more carefully and more specifically use them. And then Charles said in Talks on Truth, yet there is but one I am. It cannot be cut into parts. It is principle. I share this because we often hear we're a spark of the divine, we're a wave of the divine, 
we're a drop of the divine, we're a part or piece of the divine. In truth, the divine is everywhere present at every point in space, all at the same time. Eric Butterworth said this way, God is spirit, present in its entirety at every point in space, all at the same time. So there's no such thing as having a piece or a part, a spark or a wave. Now, our awareness of it might be like a spark or like a drop, but the totality of the divine is right there at the point of view. Now, I'm making a point of this because here in this quote, we learn that I am is a synonym for principle. And then we can learn, oh, I went, sorry, I went too soon. Then we can learn that, that the I am is the name of our spiritual self, which is distinct from our human self. So you are the I am and you are a human. Now, classically in unity metaphysics, we speak of our human self as son of man and our divinity as the child of God, the son of God and spiritual man. But in the modern self, oh, here's that quote, the I am is the metaphysical name of the spiritual self as distinguished from the human self. So what this means is, if you look at this little cartoon of Jesus, baby Jesus and Mary telling him to get in the bath water, well, Jesus is demonstrating his divinity and his humanity. So each of us is fully human and fully divine. This is so, so very important to make metaphysics practical today, to make it more user friend friendly. Now, I already said that the entirety of the divine is present at the point of view, 100% of it. So you're 100% divine and you're 100% human. Now, remember, Eric Butterworth said, God is spirit present in its entirety at every point in space all at the same time. So what does that mean for us? Well, think about this. An adult human has 37.2 trillion, with a T, cells in your body. And each of those cells take up space. But let's just go with 37.2 trillion cells. Well, if principle is present in its entirety at every point in space all at the same time, that means literally every cell of your body, all 37.2 trillion of them, has every principle and every law. This is partly why when you cut yourself, you don't have to think about healing yourself because right at every cell is divine intelligence, divine power, divine life, divine wholeness, and divine health. And so when we think of unity classically and most religions, there's the belief that God intervenes and does things for us and to us. Well, what if that isn't quite true? Well, the modern view comes from this quote, the idea that God makes man do certain things cannot be true in a single instance, because if it were, man would not be a free urgent, excuse me, a free agent. You, me, would not be a free agent if God could intervene. If God interfered with man's will in some things, it would follow that he could interfere in all and any things. Logic and observation clearly reveal the freedom of man in everything. So you are completely free. And what's really interesting about these things I'm sharing with you today, they can be find, found in the historic writings some of them in the unpublished materials. But what's really interesting, Charles Fillmore was hitting on some of these ideas almost 100 years ago. And so in a classical view, God uses us. And that's classical metaphysics as well as traditional religion. But what if that wasn't true? Can you question that answer? 
Well, the modern view is we use God. So one day I was in the archives and I was I found this um, Unity Conference and Healing Revival and I came upon this quote. God only does what man says he shall do. God is our servant. Did you ever think of that? Well, I tell you, I paused. I thought blasphemy. And I thought I might be struck dumb by God because that was the God I understood in that time. But over the years, I've come to understand this truth in a very deep and useful way. So that quote goes on to say, this wonderful spirit of God, out of which everything is made, don't miss that point, out of which everything is made, is here at all times, is present with us, and we are using that God. And now you know, there's 37.2 trillion copies metaphorically, at the point of view. But remember, Myrtle and Charles' primary definition for God is God is principle. And so we can say principle only does what we say principle shall do. Principle is our servant. When we do it that way, it makes a little more sense. And, and we're using principle all the time. In fact, we cannot not use principle. And since I include the unchangeable principles, con um, constants, and laws of science in this category, we are using principle all the time to manifest new and greater things for ourselves. So classically, we were taught thoughts give rise to feelings, and feelings do not give rise to thoughts. In fact, we're taught as if they're separate, but friends, they're not. Just as thoughts can influence emotions, emotions can also influence thoughts. That's what new science is teaching us, friends. So thoughts and feelings and thoughts and emotions are not really separate from each other. And so when we think of thoughts held in mind produced after their kind, that needs to be upgraded so we can use the law of mind action more effectively. We have to add feeling and emotion to our thoughts in order to motivate ourselves to manifest something, to create something in the world around us outside our bodies. So that law of mind action might sound like Thoughts held with feeling in my mind produce more thoughts and feelings of the same kind in my mind, in my consciousness. That spiritual law applies to consciousness. It doesn't mean the thoughts and feelings I hold in mind directly produce something outside of my body. Once we know that, we don't sit and wait for things to show up. We take action, and that's an important detail. And so another thing that we're taught, at least I was taught in 1996, is our thoughts give rise to our physical body. Well, the thing is, there is evidence in the historic writings that our consciousness participates in the production and development of our body in our mother's womb. But this teaching is only one direction. Our bodies do not impact our consciousness. And so just like Charles Fillmore looked at science for direction, so can we. So now we know our physical bodies impact consciousness. Not only do our physical bodies impact consciousness, but the colony our body is, is pointing to the bacteria that live in our guts also impact our consciousness. And so it's more important for us today to think about our bodies and our minds being more like a unit. In fact, there's a teaching that we are threefold in nature, that we are spirit, soul, and body. The way I understand that today is that we are divine, 
we are consciousness, and we are body. And they are not separate in the way that things can be separate in this world around us. And so this is where I'm going to drill down a little deeper and, and help you understand how you can use your body to positively impact your consciousness. And so how many of us are experiencing stress today? I mean, especially after the possibility of this ruling coming down from the Supreme Court that will make women not the masters of their own consciousness. I think it's unconscionable, but that's what's coming down the pike likely. And if I were a woman, I would be really under stress. As a man who supports women, supports every human, I can feel some stress around that. And then what about the stress that's happening in our society as those who believe in white supremacy are feeling more emboldened to attack black people, indigenous people, anybody who does not look like them. That adds stress to all of us. And friends, even though I'm a white man, I'm a gay white man. And if they're coming after women, they could be coming after gay people as well. And so we are living at a time when there's high stress. However, there is something we can do about it. So we have this little part in our brain called the amygdala. It regulates our emotions like fear and aggression. Now the amygdala is always asking two questions. Am I safe? Do I matter? Am I safe? Do I matter? And if the answer to either of those is no, it starts a chain reaction. Now, think about it. Do women feel safe today? I think not. And because men are in, in a process of taking control of women's body, bodies, they must think they do not matter. Same thing with the African-Americans in our country. I don't know how they could possibly feel safe. And it makes me a little sick and a little angry to know that stuff is going on. And so we have to step up in ways, folks, that we haven't stepped up in, in the past. So what happens? The amygdala triggers something called the fight or flight response by releasing hormones. And this is really fight, flight, freeze, or please. You probably understand fight. You probably understand flight, but freeze is, think of the animals that when they're under attack, they freeze. Rabbits are known to do this. Well, guess what? Humans do this, and I be one human that tends to freeze when I feel like I'm under attack. The third one is please. And I think of it more like a piece. When a person is under attack by a bully, they might go into appeasing them and pleasing them to avoid the attack. And so now, what's happening? We have an autonomic nervous system. It, it contains a sympathetic side, and a parasympathetic side. And I couldn't get that out. There we go. Okay. And so what happens, the amygdala causes a cascade of events triggering the release of hormones related to stress, particularly that's adrenaline or epinephrine and cortisol. And science is showing us that in 2022, we are probably overstimulated by cortisol because we are under long-term stress. So just as that fight, flight, freeze, or please system is hardwired, I was happy to learn about two years ago on the parasympathetic side of the nervous system, we have something else that's hardwired, calm and connect response. And we can use this to counteract the fight, flight, or freeze response. 
So this parasympathetic nervous system produces a calm and relaxed feeling in the mind and body. What happens is when it's stimulated, we give ourselves a dose of four hormones. D for dopamine, which is our pleasure and reward hormone. O, oxytocin, which creates love and bonding and connecting. S, serotonin is a mood, mood booster. And endorphins are a pain reliever. So you can't just think about these to stimulate them in your body, but there are specific things we can do. So by activating the parasympathetic side of your autonomic nervous system, you can decrease stress and anxiety in the moment. One of the ways you can do this is try it. Just gently rub your fingers on your lips. This is scientifically proven to release that dose of hormones that will eventually calm you down. Now, why do you want to be calmed down? Well, when we're under anxiety and stress, those hormones that stimulate fight, flight, freeze, or please cause the constriction of blood vessels in our brains particularly the frontal lobe. What that means is our higher thinking centers go offline. Maybe you've experienced it when you've been angry, but I certainly have. I'm a little crazy. I don't think clearly when I'm angry and also when I'm under stress. So this gently touching your lips is something you can subtly do in public that will stimulate those hormones. And by the way, this is why kissing is so great. Because when we're kissing, we stimulate those hormones and we have more of those hormones that help us to feel calm and relaxed and connected to the person we're kissing. There's another thing we can do. It's called deep abdominal breathing from the diaphragm, diaphragmatic breathing. Two of these are called calm and connect breathing, and there's four, seven, eight breathing. What these are, the most simplest, is breathing in slowly to the count of six and breathing out slowly to a count of six until you feel yourself settle down. Four, seven, eight is more specific. You breathe in to a count of four, you hold it for a count of seven, you exhale slowly to a count of eight, and you do that at least three times. Sometimes it takes four times, sometimes it takes five times. When I first learned about this, I was, I was with friends in Fort Lauderdale and, and we were driving around the city and she got a phone call and she quickly got agitated. She thought the water and electricity was going to be shut off in the place where she lived. So she was stressing. And I asked her, I said, Mara, just pull off to the side of the road. Let's do something. And I coached her through this breathing technique and I could feel her calming down. And when she did, I said, now, how are you feeling? She said, I feel calm. I'm thinking more clearly. And I just realized the electric company is calling about a house we just sold. It's not my problem. So she was able to get herself under control and she was able to think more clearly. This is such, such, such an important thing for us to know to do. If you just do it, it's hardwired and it works. And so in a way, you gotta think and remember to do it, don't you? You know, the trick is remembering to do it. So in a way you could say, Paul, but my thought is involved. That's true. But if it was just thinking, you wouldn't activate it. You must do it because this is hardwired into your body. So the next time you start to feel anxious, 
or you feel stress or you're in the fight, flight, freeze or please mode, remember to do one of these things and do it long enough. It won't take long. Do it long enough to you can feel yourself calm down and com can get completely back online. Then you can use your higher thinking center to move forward. And so friends, that's practical metaphysics for daily living. We just scratched the surface. I hope there's one of those things you will take with you. And so I invite you now to take a deep breath as we enter into a time of meditation. So one of the reasons we invite you to take a deep breath, and I usually direct you to do three deep breaths, is because of this calm and connected breathing. So let's do that. Take a deep breath in and release it. Take a deep breath in and release it. And take another deep breath in and release it. And begin to focus, gently become aware that your thinking, feeling natures are right there at the point of you, fully present, and they're under your direction. Charles Fillmore said, we must know who we are and what we are to have complete dominion. The who of you is your personality. In our personalities, we are wondrously distinct. I'm not you, you're not me, we are simply expressing who we are. What you are is your divinity. You are 100% divine. Every principle, every law is present at each of the 37.2 trillion cells and everywhere else in space all at the same time. So repeat after me, I am fully human. I am fully divine. I am fully human. I am fully divine. Every principle and every law is present in its entirety at the point of view. Two of those are the principle of benevolence and the principle of generosity. You don't have to ask for these from God, but because you are divine, you are God benevolence and generosity is fundamental to you. So I invite you now to use benevolence and use generosity to offer yourself a big old hope, helping of grace and kindness. Grace and kindness are fundamental to self-compassion, as well as having compassion for another. So let's say, I am benevolence and I am generosity. Say that with me now. I am benevolence and I am generosity. The next time at the very moment you notice 
you're withholding, giving something. Remember that you are fundamentally the principle of generosity and remember to give. The Course in Miracles says something like, the only thing missing in a given situation is what you have not provided. Think about that for a few seconds. I'm going to put it in the first person. The only thing missing in any given situation is what I have not provided. So if I'm feeling a lack of kindness or a lack of love, for example, that's a reminder for me to be kind and for me to be loving. So I invite you now to enter into a few moments of silence as you more consciously ground these ideas that will help you to be a better person in the world today. And take another deep breath and release it and say to yourself, I am fully human and fully divine. And now I invite you to say out loud, I am fully human and fully divine. And now I ask you to, to activate the power of dominion, your sense of personal authority. And let's say it again. Let's say it with authority. I am fully human and fully divine. And now I ask you to add zeal. Let's say it zealiciously together. I am fully human and fully divine and feel the truth of that because so you are, so I am, and so it is, amen. And thank you. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome.